So we have something less than one hour to, to finish the topic that we left uh, uh, partially completed in the last uh, week, so that we have a, an overview of the, um, of the whole field uh, of uh, home automation and building automation systems. Uh, I try to do just as an, as an exercise, since today we were talking about BTC, no? uh, I try to map the model, up to now we just uh, analyzed the, the network side, uh, the different classification that we'd, uh, we, we saw together last week, uh, trying to map them into the BTC system. So this should be, will be for us a way for quickly uh, analyzing and presenting the different uh, types uh, of uh, technologies. So for example here, we are, I have the main characteristics uh, of this uh, uh, my open system that we had just uh, uh, heard of. Mm -hmm. And uh, after, let's say, the, after today, where we will finish, let's say, analyzing about the, the, um, the device characteristics, uh, the next step will be to give you an overview of the main systems. Of course, my open has already been described, so I will move also to the other ones just to reason about uh, the um, good and bad points of each of the systems so that we will, able, we will be able probably to decide and to compare them hmm? on the functional point of view, but then also on the, on the cost point of view, then on the installation complexity and so on. Uh, just to remind, remind where we were when we left last time, we had a, a look of the different, uh, of the variety of the different possibilities that we had in uh, organizing a network of, of devices. And then we have to uh, analyze uh, what are the characteristics of the devices that are connected to the network. Of course, some of the char these characteristics uh, of the device are dependent on the type of network. So there is a strong dependency, but I try to separate the two in order to make it easier as I say, to discuss. So the first uh, point is, uh, if I have a device, the first question I should ask myself is uh, the function. So what is this device doing? What function, what is the, the intended purpose of the device from the application point of view? So what does it do? Hmm? Uh, and the, when describing the function, we should be careful not to describe any network related function. Of course, a device is able to communicate, to be controlled, to have an address. These are not the, the application level functionality. It's they are the network level functionality. They should be there just for the device to be connected. So uh, function means uh, it's a relay, it's a sensor, it's a display, it's what kind of interaction does it do, does it get, that you, does it allow you to do with the user or with the environment. And of course, we, we already know that there are some devices that have only just one single function, the bathroom, for example, or the relay, or multi-function. So device, a single device, that integrates many functions inside it. And this, of course, these devices that are multiple in nature, so one physical device that internally has some sort of different logical devices, is of course associated to the addressing side of the network, where we should have some way of addressing the sub-function of the device. So having some device that allows more than one function is mapped, is linked to the addressing of the sub-function inside the device itself. Uh, identification. Identification is uh, whether we have a mechanism by which the device presents itself, introduces itself to the network. On the other hand, uh, how the network can know which devices are connected and uh, uh, what, they are, what they are doing, what function they are, uh, say, implementing. I may know that this device is uh, a temperature sensor. I know. I'm the designer. I installed it there. But does the network know? Does the network have a way of knowing what, are, what this device is doing? This is a sort of a separate from this uh, uh, 
configuration of the network side. So the, the configuration of the network may, be, may have some automatic means so that uh, the network itself is able to discover the devices. This is usually a network level function. I have these 27 devices and these are their network addresses. But then one by one, what are these doing? I have address number one, some device at mapped at the address number one. And this is a network level functionality, discovering which addresses are alive in a network, basically. And then behind each of these addresses, what do we have? And uh, usually the devices can uh, report to the network some information about themselves so that the other devices in the network can understand what they are doing in some case. Um, and this is, uh, depends, of course, on the type of technology. The simplest case is that the, the device just publishes its serial number, its model number. So it means I am uh, part number uh, 1234 of manufacturer ABC. This is some case. This is information which is always available. It's, it's like reading you know, uh, what is printed on the device, but it's just as a, some information which is available also on the network. So in this case, there should be some sort of authority that assigns uh, IDs or certificates IDs to the manufacturers. And then each manufacturer will add some number, internal numbers, the, the, to differentiate the different models that is, is going to sell. If you want to know uh, what the device uh, called 1234 or manufacturer ABC is actually doing, whether it's a sensor or it's, a, uh, it's an actuator, you need to know. You need to have a sort of a dictionary of the mapping of all devices uh, to their actual functionality. So the, the device itself will not report its function. It's only report its, uh, its identification code. Hmm? Um, this is the, the simplest, the lowest level, um, say, uh, type of identification. The second uh, possibility is that the device identifies itself according to a category of possible device types. This means that the, the standard, the technology standard, has compiled a list of possible devices. Uh, you remember, for example, in the Bitticino case, in the MyOn protocol, there was one field that was uh, um, the who field. One for uh, lighting, two for, uh, what, what was that, um, thermi uh, thermical issues, and three and four, there was, there were different numbers that identified different types of functions. And so you have a, a sort of a list of possibilities and your new device will report as being able to implement that function of a relay, of a sensor, of a temperature sensor or whatever, okay? And uh, uh, so you know that, this is the case for example with Connex uh, uh, very easily, um, you have, uh, Categories of devices. So when you have a device, you query what it's doing, and you report to you, I am an actuator, relay actuator. So I know what you can do. So you describe yourself by saying, I am implementing a given, a known, a predefined class of behaviors. What may happen is that uh, the devices, uh, in many cases, can do more. So I have a relay, but this relay has also the capability, for example, of automatic switch off after a given time. If the standard doesn't have a category relay with automatic switch off, what the device will do is just to declare itself as a relay. And then it will have one additional functionality which is not published, it's not declared eh, at the network level. So you cannot discover it. Either you know it, or uh, you know that that device accepts some additional comments, or has some non-standard behavior, some behavior that goes beyond the standard, so it's compatible with the standard, but also does something more. Uh, but you, know, you must know it, or you must 
be able to understand uh, its specific commands. This is often the case with the vendor-specific extensions. So I implement the standard, and so I can interoperate with every device from any vendor brand. But I am also implementing some vendor-specific extension that only vendor ABC is using. And so if you match me device with another device from the same manufacturer, from the same vendor ABC, then I can do more. Because we can exchange more information, we can understand each other better, we can use some functionality which is beyond the standard. So this is, of course, a, a, a driving force by the manufacturers to convince you to buy different devices of the same brand. They work together better because they can do something more that the standard components just cannot do or you need more components to get, to get the same behavior. So uh, the issue is that having a fixed list of device types uh, helps in recognizing them, but uh, sort of slows the innovation. Because then if you have something new, you don't know where to fit it. And so it will go out of the standard and it will be more difficult to, inter to interoperate with other devices. There are more flexible approaches, which are the more modern ones, the more, the more dynamic ones, and these are mainly the, the ones that are um, adopted by the wireless uh, protocols, in which uh, we don't list, uh, okay, this device is a relay, but every device just declares a set of classes, let's say, a set of capabilities. They are called in different ways. Uh, in ZigBee, they are called clusters. In uh, ZigWay, they are called common classes. Uh, the concept is that uh, there are many different uh, group of fun or groups of functionalities. Let's use the term clusters, for example, different clusters of functionalities. And every device declares which clusters it implements. So it can implement the cluster on off. They can implement the cluster uh, temperature measurement. I can implement the class energy measurement, and so on. There are a group of classes. Each group corresponds to a given set of functionalities, which is in some way similar to the approach, to the high level approach that we had in DOG, for example, where we had the commons and functionalities, something quite high level, and every device is a combination of these functionalities. The same is possible here for this standard, for these technologies at the network level. So it's very easy to <clears throat> invent new devices that con contain new combinations of functionalities that are recognized as the, say, the, say the union of the, all the different clusters that they, they, they implement. So the let's say the universe from the set point of view, set theory point of view, the universe of possible devices is no longer a list, but is any possible combination of, of multiple elements for, for, from a wide list of possibilities. So you can implement the different, so you can have maybe the, 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 only the relay that you are using a smart plug, or the smart plug can also be metered, so it can also be metering the, the energy that flows through, or you can have just the, the meter without the possibility of controlling. So you have three different types of devices, the pure meter, the pure relay, and the smart plug with metering and command possibilities. Instead of defining three different types of devices, with this approach you define two clusters, on off and metering. And then you will have three devices, one of the, the, thir the first one will just tell you I'm a, an on off device, the third one will tell you I'm a meter, and the second one will tell you both uh, I'm a meter and I'm an on-off device. So it gets much more flexible. It's more difficult to match the behavior of a device into a specific, one specific category. You must see it from the different points of view of different things that it is able to do. And that is the, also one of the reasons of the wider variety of types of, if you go to a catalog of Z-Way or ZigBee components, you have many, many more different uh, um, possibilities, many more types of device. Okay, another characteristic is uh, whether the device, yeah? Uh, this is a quick, uh, of course. The, the it uses the list of functions for the 
it's, uh, it, uh, the idea is uh, the, the same, uh, what the, um, but at this level, of the device level, the, the possible functions are predefined by the technology standard. So the list of clusters in ZigBee is different from the command clusters in ZigWay. At the dog level, we try to do one step of abstraction, one further step of abstraction, and so we define commands and functionalities which will map into this, but uh, they, are, they have different names uh, just to be, they actually they match quite closely the ZigBee clusters, as, because in some way we copied the, the, the structure when designing the functionalities. But then the same approach will apply also to uh, simpler protocols, mm -hmm. because then we, is in modeling, we, we do this. Huh? This type of device can be modeled by having this set of commands. Uh, the other issue I was saying is uh, whether the device has some form of intelligence. It can be dumb, meaning that uh, the device has just one function, it does it, it does it well, I hope, but I cannot do anything about it, I cannot teach it to do anything else, I can configure it, can... Usually, the only configuration that you can do is just uh, network configuration, I give you an address, and in some cases, not even that, and, but then it will work in a given predefined way. If it's a, it's a sensor, you cannot, maybe not even program the frequency of, of the, of, of, of the, of the readings that you want it to send. The next step is having configurable devices, which are the majority, I would say. Devices that have a predefined behavior, but with some parameters that can be tweaked. So you can change the frequency, you can change the thresholds, uh, you can change the delay, you can change uh, some whether, you, whether or not you want the, for example, the switch off capability or whatever. So you have some sort of parameters that are able to shape the behavior of, this, of the device, but the behavior itself is fixed, is predefined. Hmm? Uh, this, how, how this can configure, it depends, because maybe some software configuration that you can do on the fly, the software configuration that you can do only when you're installing the, the plant, so the system configuration phase, something that may be done with jumpers, with the trimmers, well, there are ma many ways of doing that. But the issue is that you are setting some parameters into uh, otherwise fixed behavior. The next step is uh, devices that allow some software to be written into their memory. So actually, there's a flashing phase in which you can, in some, with some procedure, uh, which is usually done when the plant is shut down, no, it's not operating, you take a device and you upload the, uh, some software onto the, the, uh, the device memory. Uh, and then the device will execute that program, of course. We have two, different, two very wide categories in this case. First is uh, this happens every time a device is, uh, can be upgraded through the a a firmware um, up, uh, up, uh, update or upgrade. So for example, in Connex, uh, what you can do when you buy new devices hmm, with the configuration tool, you just connect to the gateway, the device is on the bus. You connect with your PC to the gateway and download from the manufacturer of the device the latest version of, of its code, of its binary code, and through the, you download it into the PC and you send it through the gateway to the device. And the device will load the new version of the software that maybe has some bug fixes, has some new functionalities, or, or whatever. So it's in a, the operation is transparent to your computer, is also transparent to the gateway. Only the manufacturer and the device know what's happening. There's a way to tra transfer a new binary image of the firmware, firmware code from the manufacturer to the device. And so it's a sort of updating. It's programmable, but it's only programmable by the initial manufacturer. You cannot do anything as an end user. So you can 
download the new programming, a new version, and then you will configure it, usually. Actually, what Connex does is that uh, in the download of new uh, versions, you also, you also have a tables of configuration variables that then can be showed by, shown to you in a window where you can set the, the parameters. But actually, you are not programming it. The next step would be actually being able to download the user-driven software. That means not the end user, but the installer or the system integrator that can download some software into the, um, the device itself. For example, about Bisticino, we have a small uh, um, touch screen. It's a three inches touch screen uh, with Linux on board and the software running the, 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 the device is open source. So you can actually download the software, modify it, compile and update uh, the touch screen with their own behavior. So maybe you will want to retain the basic functions, but if you want to change, uh, to um, customize uh, the user interface or the function of the device, you can do that by code, by coding. Of course, you need to learn how to program into the device, the language, the IO, the libraries, and so on. But it can be done at the user level. Hmm? Of course, you need to be careful not to hang it. Hmm? Um, the next step would be smart devices. So devices by themselves that actually boot up a sort of a small operating system and they have their own logical behavior, they want to do choices. They want to do something that want to decide what, to, what they want to do. For example, the, the famous Nest thermostat that has a, some in learning side, connects to, them, to the internet uh, to send the data over the cloud and uh, um, programs uh, a temperature pattern by itself and so on. So all the other cases usually, in all the other cases from here to there, usually the device is executing some external orders or some external program. In the last case, the device uh, has some degree of smartness, so it can decide by, uh, on its own. Hmm? In today, hmm, today, these kind of devices uh, tend to be isolated devices. Smart widgets, smart devices, smart appliances that are smart uh, by themselves. It's very difficult today to see them integrated with other devices. So they're very nice objects, but mm, they tend to live by, them, by themselves and not to play very well. They, they don't play very well with other devices. Or, or they don't play at all with other devices, I would say. Today, maybe it's going to change in the future. When uh, you see here that there's a sort of a transition or two different words that are merging. The word of uh, electrical plants, where everything is defined, predetermined with some little configuration, and the word of computer electronics or consumer electronics, where you want to have something that is nice, that is fast, that is smart, that is programmable, and so, and so on. And uh, mm, the type of devices that we have come from these two different worlds with very, very different ways of thinking. If you take a consumer electronics company, they reason in six months time frames. So if you go there in the same shop six months later, you will not find any of the components that they were selling six months earlier. Compare it with uh, what uh, Bitticino said before, that after 15 years, you can go and still find a replacement, a one-to-one -one replacement to some device. So they are thinking in different time scales, so they have different objectives, market objectives and technical objectives, and they produce different types of devices. It would be nice if the future will show us something which, that has the smartness, programmability, and the innovation of consumer technologies, and the same durability of plants as we are, here, are, we, as we are used to. I don't know whether this will happen. That would be my hope hmm? of this, uh, as the, the outcome of, of this war of the different, uh, say, industry segments in the home.
Another issue is the automation, which is less than the intelligence. So uh, how, if the device can sort of implement some automatic behavior, we, so not just reacting to a command, do this, I will do it, do that, I will do that, but doing something on its own, what are the mechanisms for doing that? So just to make an example, when a, a present sensor feeds a one person, then the light is switched on. This is not intelligence, it's just basic automation. So how is it programmed if the devices have this capability? So the first uh, um, type of automation will be triggers or events. If you, if you are using a computer science uh, terminology, we will call them events. So some device will detect some condition and this condition usually is uh, defined by configuration. So I configure the, the temperature threshold to be 0 0.5 degrees. So whenever the temperature changes more than half a degree, it will trigger one condition. And then the device will send, up, send out, usually by broadcasting it, this information. Hey, something happened. The temperature sensor has been triggered. Tuck. Huh? It's firing an event. The event may be sent to everybody or just to a group of devices or to a specific device, depending on the configuration and depending on the capability of the device itself. It depends. But the, the, the mechanism is that the device is always looking for something, and when this happens, it will, will, will tell. It will tell to the network. And probably other devices will, will react to this trigger, and will receive it and then act or react to that. Um, this is one possibility, which it's one of the most flexible, actually. The other possibility, which is what you are doing with Connex, is binding. Binding means to make, uh, let's say, creating a match between one specific output variable of a device and one specific input variable of a different device or group of devices. Let's set the groups aside. So you are programming the devices by saying, okay, device number 25, your output 8, which is the temperature, must be bound to the input number 3 of, I don't know, the, 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 the valve controlling the, 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 hot, the hot water, for example. So, uh, maybe a, a, a Boolean or a proportional binding. So you're programming a system like this. You are sort of connecting outputs to inputs. So you don't reason about events anymore or time points anymore. You reason about replicating a value. The value that is there, that is computed by a device, is replicated into that other device. So if the one device is a button, a zero one of this button will be replicated into the toggle, for example, variable of a lamp, of a relay, uh, say, a controlling a lamp. And so every time I push this, is I'm changing actually also the value of the relay. And so I'm commanding that. Hmm? So, uh, of course, these bindings are just a conceptual tool. We see the networks as drawing lines between variables. Of course, these lines will travel onto packets, network packets, so they will be need to be sent in some way, but we don't see it when you are programming that. It's uh, less flexible than triggers, because triggers, if you block something, then who is interested can, be read, can read it and can react in different ways. With bindings, you are sort of uh, matching and configuring a set of possibilities. You cannot do something totally strange. The simpler form of matching of, or binding, simpler one, so it's a kind of binding but simpler, is just address matching. Is what uh, my home is doing. So the example was that we have a button here which has an address configured one, two, 
and when I press it, every other device that has been configured with the same address will react. So you are creating fixed bindings on the basis of the assignment of addresses. In some way, you are confusing the address assignment of the devices, so creating the network by assigning addresses, and you're confusing it with the configuration of the behavior of the system. You are using the same tool, addresses, to do both functionality. And again, it's less flexible, and therefore it's easier to do, or, or none. For example, Modbus, which is a, just a memory-based, a register-based technology, has no native, native uh, automation mechanism. So there is only a master that can decide everything. Can read one variable and write another. But the devices themselves cannot take any action by default. They don't, they are not even able to speak to each other because they are all slaves and they just need to wait uh, to respond until query. So it's not, uh, uh, not, not all uh, automation systems actually have devices that are capable of doing some automatization. Even if program, even if simple, in some protocol it's just not possible. You need a central controller that gets all the information and then decides and then sends out comments. Which is the, the, the old concept in the industrial automation. No, like all the PLC, the programmable logical controllers, had a very central view. That is one matrix saying, okay, these are the inputs, these are the outputs, what are the connections? And it's all centralized. Modbus was, was born, let's say, to distribute the inputs and the outputs, but to retain the centralized control which in some way it's also convenient because it's very predictable what happens. Configuration. We say that some devices can be configurable. And in these cases, how do we that? How do we do that? What is the mechanism for changing or setting the configuration of the device? Uh, let's start from uh, one example, Bitticino. One possibility is a hardware configuration. I, I, I think it's the only network that I know that uses this mechanism. You have jumpers here that just plug into jumper holes. And these jumpers, uh, I, we don't see it in this picture, but they are numbered. Them, jumper one, two, three, four, two, two, nine. Actually, they are resistors, resistances with, with different values of resistance. The device is able to read it and so it reads a configuration, a numeric configuration, one, two, three, seven, from the jumpers that has been set. So it's a sort of a hardware configuration. I set some switches or I plug some, uh, some jumpers, and this is the operation that they do to configure the device. Of course, to, for doing that, usually I need to unplug the device, configure, and replug it again, or maybe reboot even the, the plant. Uh, at the opposite, we have a totally software in-network um, configuration. So, for example, uh, there may be comments, like all the other comments. There will be a, one comment that says switch on, and another comment that, that, that will say change the configuration. And so there are normal messages. So the devices are normally able to reconfigure themselves as they run. It's part of their normal behavior. This is true, for example, with Modbus. We have all registers. Some registers are used for parameters, configuration parameters. Some registers are just used to comment the outputs. You can write either register at any time. So doing a, a reconfiguration is no different than, issue, than issuing a comment, it's just writing a register. Or the wave, it's more advanced, of course, but it has comments. If I want to set, a, to change the polling frequency of a sensor, I just send it a comment. In the same way, I, I would send it a, a query command or another on or off comment or whatever. So it's the same, it's one of the functionalities, there's nothing special in this case. Or in the middle, we have the what, uh, for example, Connex is doing, that uh, 
a reconfiguration is a function supported by the network. It can be done without disconnecting, without doing any hardware operation. It's done by exchanging data over the network, but you must put the network in some speci special mode. So you stop the behavior of the system, say, okay, let's enter the configuration mode. Let's use some specific software. For example, this is the ETS software for, screenshot of the ETS software for Connex, in which you have the different devices. And uh, when you select the device, you have, you have all the properties that can be configured on that, div on that device. And then at, at the end, when you save everything and send to the devices, then the network is put into configuration and some special commands are sent to devices. But you, you, the, the network itself cannot do it. One device cannot reconfigure another. You need an external software to connect and, and give, a, 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 say, special commands in that case. So you have all the possibilities. Uh, power, we already mentioned it last time, about how devices get their power. It can be uh, through permanent uh, supply or, let's say, temporary supply like, like uh, batteries. And uh, we, if they are powered, they can get power from the mains or from the bus. We already mentioned that last time. Um, or better operated. And in better operated mode, uh, we know that uh, uh, it will also change the way the device operates. Every better operated device actually must use uh, a, a trigger-based behavior. What is that? Sorry, I'm lost. Go away. If the device is uh, better operated, uh, it will always use uh, triggers because it only needs to be awake and to transmit when something happens. All other modalities are too uh, power hungry or energy hungry to be used. Hmm? And, um, and so that, that will change also the way the, the, go away, the, way the device is behaving. Uh, and we also mentioned uh, in Ocean, uh, I, I will bring some devices next week uh, to see uh, that are able, in, in many cases, to get their energy from the environment. Hmm? Okay, last two categories. One is location. Where are the devices located? And how can we, or whether, can we move them during their operation? Uh, well, first of all, this is a strange thing. But uh, where the device is located uh, is an important information, but in most of the cases is missing from the technologies. It's an information, the device doesn't know where it is. It knows what it can do. It knows that it can measure a temperature, but it doesn't know what is the room in which it is located, and so the room to which temp the temperature is related. It's an information that is not needed, of course, for the operation of the devices. Who cares? You need to do one job, do it, wherever, wherever you are. But in, invariable, invariably, always, the applications need to take over this responsibility. I need to know, for doing any useful application, where are my devices located? What, where is the light that I'm reaching on or off? Otherwise, I'm, I'm risking of reaching the, the wrong light. Um, so, but this information, this explicit information about the location usually is not available on the device and is not available on the network. It's only available at the application level. It's a pity, but it's uh, as it is. Concerning the physical location, well, we may have uh, fixed devices. Usually all devices or most devices connected to a bus, they are screwed to the bus. So you cannot move them without shutting everything down, of course, and doing and uh, So they are, in, once you put there, they will move. Or they can be movable devices. Move, movable means, uh, in my terms, that uh, you can disconnect from one point and connect it to the other point. When it's in the second point, it will start working again. 
but during the transportation, it will be off. Smart plugs. If you have a smart plug, when you plug in, it will work, it will connect, try to connect to the network and so on. When you plug it off, then it dies. But you can move it very easily and you replug it any, in some, some other place. So you can move it, but while it's operating, it will be fixed, but can be moved easily. Uh, moved by, of course, shutting down the device, but the rest of the network uh, will keep alive, we hope. And then we have mobile devices, like um, a mobile phone, of course, the, the name tells it, uh, RFIDs or some uh, sensor, that wireless sensor that can be moved uh, in many places. In particular, one case of mobile devices, so in general mobile means that can be moved and its position may change without affecting its behavior. There's one specific case of mobile or mobility, which is mobility related to one person. So the device may move, but it will always be attached or associated to one person. This mic is a mobile device, I can move it, but it will, it will always go wherever I go. So this is an information that we have. The location of the device and the location of one specific user are the same. So it's in some further information that we have. So devices are designed to be worn or to be uh, carried by one person at all times. In other cases, it's something that you can leave it and you can move it there, you can do uh, different stuff, and, but you don't know whether the person is associated with the device. It's more flexible. Finally, I call it virtualization because I didn't have a better name, actually. So, okay, we, up to now, we, des we described the taxonomy in which we try to analyze the capability of a network and the capability of the devices connected to that network. But it may happen that you want to have some devices of one technology and try to connect them to a different type of network. You cannot do that directly. The, the, the voltage level, uh, level we, we, uh, wouldn't match, for example. Uh, so you, but, or the protocol doesn't uh, work. But uh, you may have additional devices or ways to uh, integrate into one network, one device that belongs to a different technology. <clears throat> one way is the sort of a protocol proxy. So I am at my home with the Chino network. I want to connect one device that has, for example, Connex. You go to Bitichino, they will tell you, or they will sell, sell you a Connex adapter. So a small node that has one connex connection on one side and one my own connection on the other side. So your connex device will appear on the network, on the my home network, as it will look like a native my home device. Because there's one additional component that is able to proxy it, to translate it, to stand in front of it, and then to take over its command and its functionalities. This is useful if you have one big, uh, say, network, and you want to add some specific components of different technologies. Maybe you have a bus system, and you want to add some sec sensors that maybe due to the locations are very hard to reach with the bus. And so you want to install them in a wireless way. So in this case, you may, you, you may bridge the wireless network onto the bus network. Uh, Another possibility which is starting in some way to, have, to appear are uh, software nodes or virtual devices, actually virtual devices. Uh, when some actual software running on some platform will register itself on the network and will interact with other devices. So maybe I don't have a sensor that measures uh, the, the power consumption but I can compute it via software, then I will register on the network as a meter. I'm not a meter. I'm, for one, one, one specific example, you know the, about the dishwasher in the, of the Energy Atom uh, Consortium uh, built by Indesit, uh, 
Uh, this dishwasher gives you the information about the power that is consuming. But it doesn't have any meter inside. It just knows the software of the dishwasher, uh, not the dishwasher, sorry, the, the washing machine for clothes. The washing machine knows what it's doing at the moment. If it's uh, heating with a resistance, it knows how many watts the resistance is. If it's uh, operating the engine, it, it knows the power profile of the engine, and so on. So it, it, the, the software on board of the washing machine is able to estimate its power, current power consumption. It's a software, but it can look like a real meter device because it will tell you some energy and power measurements. They're not measurements. Energy and power values associated to some device, some appliance. They are not actually measurements in the, say, physical sense of term, but they are numbers that reflect some computation. So in some cases, you may have more network nodes than actual physical nodes, because some of them are emulated. And this, uh, as the networks become more and more intelligent, is going to increase in some way. It's, a, it's a, an easy way to make the network more intelligent by emulating uh, number devices in software. So this is the big picture. Okay, so next time, next week, uh, we will uh, give an overview of the technologies. Uh, remember that uh, who wants for once tomorrow, there will be a seminar of Connex uh, in room number 27. And uh, together with the people, the electrical engineer. Thank you for tonight. Bye-bye.